Well, welcome to everybody who's joined us uh, for a session on policing protests is the balance right between the right to protest and the rule of law. If you've come to the wrong seminar, well, stay here because it'll be more interesting than the one you'd, that you'd plan to go on. Because uh, it's going to be exciting, thrilling hour, much better than being being at a conference and having to drag yourself all the way to Brighton or Blackpool or something. You can do it from home. We have a, a very good panel. Unfortunately, uh, Umesh Desai uh, can't join us, the, the Assembly member from East London, which is rather a shame because Umesh started his politics. Uh, he's got a long tradition in Labour politics, but he started his politics campaigning uh, against racism in the East End. So it's rather a shame we don't have him. But but we are lucky to have three exceptionally good people instead. And I'm just watching to see which of them smiles when I say that and look slightly embarrassed. But none of them are looking embarrassed. So I will, I will I, in, in, in no particular order, we've got Fiona Hamilton, who's the crime and security, security editor of The Times. Uh, she started her journalism career in Australia and has been with The Times since 2008 because she covered Boris Johnson's mayoralty. So, uh, Fiona, are you able to give us the, the skinny on Boris and uh, what's happening and uh, some of the terrible things that are going on? You can give us the, 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 full, the full story. That might be more interesting even than talking about the, the, the subject, I'm sure. I think that's know. a whole other seminar. Yeah. <laughs> well, feel free, to, feel free to share your information with us. We're, it's a Labour Party audience. We're happy to hear bad things, you know. Um, then we've got Sir Mark Rowley who is the former Assistant Com Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. He was knighted um, in the 2018 birthday honours for his exceptional contribution to national security at a time of unprecedented threat and personally providing reassuring national leadership through the attacks of 2017. Incidentally, if any of you have seen the, the blurb for this, um, I'm just reading from it because that's just the easiest way to, to introduce people. Um, anyway, before that, he was, he was, um, he's, he's done a variety of roles. He's been a, an Assistant Commissioner and immediately after London riots, led the response and transformed approaches to policing gangs. So he's got he's got a long history in the police, and will be interesting to talk to and tell us lots of interesting things and stories about what the police were getting up to. Mark, I, I, I'll look forward to that. That's another seminar as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I know Nick Bracken, so he he's always telling me interesting stories about metropolitan police. Yeah, I bet he is. Uh, and then we've got Mark Mike Schwartz, who's a partner in protest and civil liberties team at HGA Solicitors. He's a field-leading expert in the law surrounding protests and is well-versed in defending those facing the most serious and complex offences. He's also particularly well-known for representing high-profile political activists and chip campaigners championing a diverse range of social justice issues, such as animal rights, pacifism, and racial equality. So again, Mike, you'll have lots of interesting things to tell us about that. So this sounds really exciting. Right. The full seminar covered. <laughs> Yeah, well, if we run out of time, if we run out of, uh, of, of steam, we'll, we'll get onto them. So I'm going to be very, very quick in my introduction. We're here to discuss uh, the disruption that's been orchestrated by Extinction Rebellion and other movements over the last few years, uh, and really to debate where the rights of protesters end, the rights of ordinary citizens to go about their lives uninterrupted begins. Clearly, people feel very strongly about issues, but how far should they be allowed to disrupt other people's lives? Equally, the right to protest is very important to us as a democratic society. So, defending people's rights to protest is absolutely essential. I, I was I was thinking about it, and I was I was thinking about two different examples of protest, which I think can uh, put in and in, in sh shows the different sides of this. There was the very nice protest at Trinity College, Cambridge, where they they dug up some grass and did a bit of damage, and uh, and and basically sat around having a, a, a nice time and but protesting and making making the, the protest and, and and in a way that while it may have done damage to the grass was 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 they, they were clearly protesting there in Cambridge. The other was in Canning Town where at seven o'clock in the morning some people got on a, a train and decided to stop a train in Canning Town, which is in Newham, which is where I was mayor for many years, in Canning Town where people were going to work who, if they didn't get to work, don't get paid. And these people were dragged off the train. You can see on YouTube, were dragged off the train by a bunch of very angry people who were trying to get to work. So I thought those two contrasts are very interesting and perhaps are some of the things we might want to discuss as we discuss how far protesters should be able to go in disrupting people, but also how far they have a right to, to, to protest to make the point. So 
I will take it in the order of what I'm, I'm going to do. It's, uh, you've got seven minutes each. I, I'm looking forward because apparently I have the power to cut you off. Um, so I look forward to abusing that power. Uh, so if you could keep it to seven minutes, please, I'd be very grateful. And I'll, I'll kick off with uh, Fiona. Thanks, Robin. Uh, so I was going to talk a little bit about my recent experiences, I suppose, in covering protests, uh, because I've probably written quite a lot more about um, about protests than I ever might have expected to in the first few months of a global pandemic. Of course, there's been quite a lot of activity in that area. I mean, the police have always trod a very difficult and fine line when it comes to how they police protests, allowing people the liberty of expressing their of expressing their views and uh, the issues of freedom of speech without the, the significantly impacting upon everyone else. I think what was already quite a fraught issue for them has obviously become um, exceedingly difficult in the time of COVID. Um, one of the things that perhaps doesn't get so much publicity is the risk to officers themselves that... Uh, if you go on a Black Lives Matter protest or an environmental protest, you're making a personal choice. But those officers in the Met's public order unit who are turning up and and um, in some times, as we've seen, being uh, met with violence and uh, people abusing them in very close proximity. Uh, of course, they're wearing PPE, but they get to go home to their families. And um, that's a whole, uh, with the risk of carrying this um, insidious virus, and that's sort of an aspect to protest that we haven't seen before. And I suppose it's an interesting question to be asked, does that then alter the balance between when we should allow people to protest and how much um, the Met Police in particular, uh, how much they should, uh, you know, make arrangements for it to go on? Um, the... The, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests obviously caused significant debate. Um, there was a, a very well-known incident in Bristol where the Colston statue was, was torn down. Um, I think that sort of underlines one of the biggest challenges for police when they, when they uh, are intervening at protests and at what point they should be intervening. Uh, they're, they're making very difficult quick decisions on the ground in a split second uh the officers on the ground have to make those decisions they can't they can't really defer as much as they might be able to in less fast moving situations the decision obviously in bristol was taken to allow the statue to be removed it took them by surprise which some might say was a little bit surprising in itself given the amount of activity that had been happening locally about that statue over the years but even so they decided not to intervene because they felt that that would make the matters worse. Uh, the protesters were, of course, then able to sort of rumble the statue through the streets of Bristol and um, and throw it into the harbour. Uh, and I, I had some conversations at the time with quite senior officers who were a little bit dismayed to see that going on because they felt that a, a lack of a, a, an act of criminal damage had been empowered. Of course, the other point of view is that that statue was highly controversial and there had been years with which people have been trying to get it down democratically. Um, and so it was a very complex issue. And I think it's very difficult to the police when they decide to intervene in these, in these situations that um, are political, they're emotional, and not ordinarily something for them to have to make um, judgments about, which leads me to the to the other sort of key factor that I've noticed um, in in protests and reporting of protests. I suppose uh, a few months ago, when we saw uh, the widespread proliferation of Black Lives Matter protests and officers um, deciding whether or not to bend the knee, and in some situations coming under quite significant pressure to do so from the protesters. Now, I don't think there's many people who would argue that wasn't an excellent cause, but again, that caused um, significant concern at senior levels. And I believe a bit of division at senior levels about when officers should be allowed to do it and enabled to do it and whether you should be preventing them from doing it. So it was quite straightforward in, in a public order situation. They were told not to do it. And Dane Cressida Dick, head of the Met, was quite clear about that publicly, that officers shouldn't be bending the knee because in a fast moving situation like that, you can't be caught off guard on your knee and you might need to be able to move and take um, some sort of proactive measures. But officers were definitely, senior leadership were definitely divided as to outside those kind of operational decision, um, operational situations, whether or not 
uh, they should just sort of give a signal to their officers to do it. And I know there were a few forces where they were told um, that really under any circumstances, they shouldn't be doing something like that because police, the, 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 the motto of British policing is to police without, well, obviously police by consent, but also police without fear or favour to remain impartial. Uh, and when the far right protests happened in quick succession, and there was obviously a different uh, policing approach to um, those rallies, with very good reason, they were extremely violent and abusive. Uh, the far right were able to use the bending knee issue as part of their propaganda. So I just think that's just a very difficult. I don't purport to know the answer to any of these issues, to be honest, but um, very big challenge. Uh, and then the final challenge, it's something that's spoken a, a lot about in policing, is the uh, Public Order Act, which has, uh, Mark and Mike would know better than me, but been around for um, a very long time, is considered not fit for purpose. There's difficulties with police being able to disperse people quickly enough. Um, they governs the rules of what they're able to do when people want to protest. And I know that there is a big movement within policing to have that changed. Um, I think sometimes the public don't necessarily understand understand uh, quite how difficult it is, the challenge of, of um, responding to some of these situations. I had a very interesting conversation with somebody at the Met last week about the Extinction Rebellion protests. And of course, when you get a bunch of protesters who sit on a busy street on a bus, say, and, and stop people going about their jobs and their daily business, and you're told to just move them on, what we perhaps don't know about is the fact that the protesters, some of them had bike locks around their arms, um, chaining themselves to the bus. And and they'd encase their arms in concrete and the Met Police officers had to go in with hand tools and sort of chip away at the concrete um, without, doing any, without doing any damage to their arms uh, and get them away. It's a very slow process and I, I think sometimes that we need to hear a little bit more about uh, what's going on in order to understand the, the level of the challenges um, to them. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Fiona. That was almost exactly seven minutes. I trust that Mark oh. and Michael managed, that, oh, managed to be as good. But before I call Mike, um, just to say to everybody that's listening, the vast hordes of people listening, um, if you are watching on Zoom, please use the button to raise your hand if you have a question, because uh, we will be taking questions um, after we have the next two speakers. So next up, Mike, I've already described who you are, if you'd like to take it from here and stick to seven minutes. I'll try to. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I got the title, Policing Protest is the Balance Right Between the Right to Protest and the Rule of Law. And I think the debate's moved on, actually, because we are now facing an existential and urgent threat of climate change and habitat degradation. And people's firm views and the threat that they face needs to be interpreted against that background. Last year, the UN said that we had 12 years to fix address the climate problem that's been reduced recently to 18 months things are really urgent and pressing and understandably people think for their own sake and for others that they need to take action now because the threat is existential and so if one's looking at your balance um, the right to protest i think needs a bolstering and it's the rule of law that we need urgently to uh, review and refine because it's not fit for purpose. Now, there's obviously an instinct to demonize protesters. And I saw Priti Patel described uh, XR protesters as eco crusaders turned criminals in the Daily Mail. But I think one must, must remember that these are people who are acting through instinct and through altruism. They represent a vast swathe and cross section of society, class, race, and social background. And above all, there's a large number of young people. And I focus on young people because they may not have voted in the last election. They may not have contributed towards the problem. They didn't cause the problem, and yet they will have to live with the problem more than many others. Some people may not even have voted this time round. By the time the problem is supposed to be fixed, that will be time for their first vote. So they reflect a constituency which is disenfranchised by what's happened in the past and what is not happening currently. And they're not the only ones, there's the people who are not yet born, there's the global south, 
there's uh, nature itself, which is fighting back with um, emissions of methane from the permafrost in the Arctic, and also the um, melting of the ice sheets, which are reflecting heat from the earth. Now, I say that because if one's looking at the rule of law, one has to see what the flaws are in the democracy that created it, and they are very significant. Short-termism is the order of the day, and the rule of law doesn't reflect that. And then if one looks at the right to protest, what are the levers, the other the alternative levers people have? They don't have the right to vote. They don't have the opportunity as Prince Charles has, for all the best of reasons, through his position, being able to reflect his views in the papers today. They can't talk about the what Prince Charles called the need for swift action on climate change. They don't have the privilege of having access to the editorials. They don't have the, um, the money and the influence, such as the fossil fuels company who, companies who for decades have, have shed and hidden the problem for their own interest of climate change and the contribution that fossil fuel burning makes to that. They don't have those options. So what is their option? They don't have lobbyists. They can't pay as Russian oligarchs do towards the Conservative Party. They don't benefit from the revolving doors of political host to business interest, their only route to express themselves is through protest. And that's why it's so important that the right to protest is not only protected, but enhanced. Now, if one's turning this in terms of the rule of law, what are the mechanisms? The first is the European Convention on Human Rights, which rights which no doubt will be under threat as the next barrage of attacks on civil liberties from the government comes through, but at the moment we have Article 10, which is freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. And it must be remembered that the state has an obligation not only to uh, uh, respect those rights and not to infringe them, but also to enhance and, and uh, allow people to express themselves. And there's a real danger that that's not happening at the moment and won't happen in the future because of the climate of hostility towards protest. But I think it goes wider than that. I think one must look at Article 2, the right to life, and the state's obligation to protect life, our own, our children's, people around the world. And also, I think one has to look seriously now when thinking about the rule of law at introducing the rule of ecocide, making it an offence to do any, make any steps that threaten our existence, that threaten our planet and our nature. And that's where the focus of attention ought to be by the lawmakers. And at the moment, I think they're failing to do that by short termism, which is threatening this. All. Uh, right. Is that you, Mike? I'm done. Thank you. you done? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You were even quicker. You were even better than Fiona. So Fiona, you're going down to my second favourite person now. Mark, it's on you now. See if you can do such a good job as the last two speakers. I'll, I'll give it my best, give it my best shot. <laughs> um, so where I'm going to start from is, so the fundamental right to protest, I don't imagine any of us are going to challenge that. It's, it's essential in a democracy. Um, Parliament has already set down conditions for what the boundaries as to what is fair and reasonable in that and what isn't. Um, the, the, the issue I want to centre on is, I think the laws created have created a line between the lawful and the unlawful, where the line is in the right place, but it is now almost unenforceable. And I think there's, so, so there's, there's, there's two separate points there. So. Um, I mean, the law talks about conditions being put on protest where, um, where people, police fear serious disorder, serious damage might be done, serious disruption to life or community, or the deliberate intimidation, intentional, intentional intimidation of others going about their lawful business. So there's a, sort of, there's a set of principles there which sort of make sense and create a line. Um, the challenge, though, is the law is vague and weak. And so the part of the problem the police end up with is, is being the ones left carrying the responsibility for executing the law that Parliament put in place. It's, it's, it's vague and weak, and that creates the challenges that you've heard senior police officers um, talk about. And I found myself um, policing um, difficult protests when I was in charge of that in London. 
fact, I remember once getting judicially reviewed three times in four days for one protest, um, which I think must be some sort of some sort of record. And I was proud that we sort of won them all, but it was it's, it's illustrated the slight bizarreness and and contentiousness of the of the subject area. Um, why do I say the law's vague? Um, I think once you get past fearing serious disorder and damage, which are quite clear what they mean. Um, if it's about serious disruption, what is disruption? What does that actually mean? Because every protest is disruptive. If I stand on a street corner and, and, and shout about an issue I'm concerned about, I'm causing minor disruption. But that's clearly within the law in terms of that's reasonable and all the rest of it. Um, if I close down a whole city centre with a protest, when does when's that reasonableness lost? And so the, the police have no yardstick to look at what serious disruption is. And that has been left by Parliament in their lap, which creates a very sort of difficult um, uh, greyness. And the point I would um, point I would make is, um, if Robin, so post your career in sort of uh, in local government, if, if you set up a, a business and you're doing fantastically well, if I do a massive fraud against your business, taking millions of pounds away from you, I can get at least ten years. I can get up to ten years in prison. If I smash up all your premises and again, cost you millions of pounds, I can get up to 10 years in prison. If I cause you millions of pounds of, of losses by interrupting your business through protest um, and breaching the police's conditions, I can get up to three months in prison. It's, then that's the maximum. And that, I think, illustrates the difference about how, this disru how disruption is treated as a very minor, as a very minor issue. I think so when you've got this, this vagueness and this low level of, of penalty, and we've seen the police arresting at protests, people breaching these conditions and re multiple arrests, and many of them getting conditional discharges or, or small fines. Um, and that's not criticising the courts. The courts are, are executing the law as laid down by Parliament. Now, um, I think politicians need to take a hard look at this. Either they're relaxed about a law which is... Um, in some situations bordering on the unenforceable and think that's actually a good thing and strikes the right balance in terms of freedoms and things. It's better to do that than to make it more draconian. Or actually, um, they want that line more robustly policed, in which case um, some of the clarity and definition about issues like serious disruption they're dealing with and the severity of offences need to change. Um, and that's not to say, um, picking up some of Fiona's points, that police have have always got it spot on. Policing protest is messy and difficult and um, sort of certainly the things I was involved in and I led didn't always go um, perfectly well either. I think Fiona hits the, the, the nail on the head with two or three points she made about, um, so without fear or favour, the police must operate without fear or favour and should not, tactics should not vary based on any sort of natural inclination to sort of supporting or having a so having some sense of support for an agenda which seems sort of um perhaps morally more um uh, uh, naturally right to, to somebody else's agenda and that's quite that's quite tricky um and i can see how some police officers um felt under pressure to take the knee but i think the commissioner is exactly right that's the wrong thing to do not that the police can't have a lot of support for the sentiment of the Black Lives Matters movement and some of the awfulness that, that caused it with the, the way um, George Floyd met his death at the hands of police officers. Um, but being supportive of the sentiment is one thing. Align yourself to a movement which has political objectives um, is, is not what the police should do, regardless of personal, um, uh, personal views. And that sort of, um, I think you can see the example of that with the Bristol case that, um, Fiona quoted, it may well have been sometimes in a policing operation you get surprised and it's too late to intervene in something and that, that may well have been the case in Bristol and sort of I, I would never criticise somebody for that. Um, but you need to be absolutely clear that there's no virtue in that. The police should not intentionally set out to allow a serious crime to happen, um, however much public support there is for it. If the politicians have failed, if the local politicians failed and have left in place a statue which um, is tasteless and should be removed, then the politicians should deal with that. The way of dealing with that is, is not for the police to decide to let a serious crime happen, um, as, as opposed to what I think happened in this. I think sometimes it's been inferred that's what happened. Um, 
I think what it was more about was an operation being surprised and not being able to stop something which can happen to happen to anybody. Um, but the key issue for me, coming back to where I started um, and watching the watching the clock, I think I'm getting close to the time, is this point yes. about, I think we have a very clearly drawn line in law and I wouldn't suggest the police want that to be reopened and it's probably not right for the police to ask for the line to be sort of to be open. But I think it's perfectly fair to say to politicians, if you want this law to be effectively enforced and businesses, for example, not to have massive losses as a consequence of protest, then uh, then actually there's some work to be done to reduce, to, to remove the vagueness and the weakness of that law. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, right. So we've had some interesting contributions. They've ranged a little bit. I'll just try and, and sum up a little bit. And if I don't sum you up accurately, stick your hand up and tell me you want to say a bit more. So from, from uh, Fiona, I, I mean, clearly the COVID issue is a, a separate issue from it, but a big issue and one that has to be seriously considered not from the point of view of the protests, but what they then do in terms of spreading to other people and the, the implications for other people. But that hopefully, when when this this when we finally got on top of it, if indeed we do, then hopefully that becomes less of an issue. But it's, it's a, a, an important point, I think, to be considered in light of everything else, since it's dangerous for people who aren't on the march. So there, there are clearly issues issues with that. Um, I, I think the um, if I can link. If you're your point where you're talking about the statue being taken down in Bristol and there'd been democratic debate about whether or not it should be taken down, if I can link that then into perhaps Mike's question, Mike's comment about uh, the challenge in democracy when there's something very serious like climate change occurring. And I think while the, we can have a, a, a perfectly good debate about the level of, of protest you're allowed to and how serious um, the proposers are climate change. There is no doubt we are not climate change deniers here. We are not the Republican Party, so we are going to accept the climate change issue. Now, the question is, how far is that as an important issue? How far have you the right to take action against what people have taken the view in terms of democratically, how far they want to go and how far they, they're prepared to give their votes to the environment? If young people aren't voting on the environment, then how far does then protest substitute for democracy and, and I think I think we'd all agree with um, with Mike that we have a problem with democracy in the, in the short termism of it so where where does that link I think um, Mark is raising issues I think Mark you're asking for the impossible you're saying politicians need to decide whether they want to let things go the way it is or maybe we can beg or whether they want to stop the protest doing the the disruption they're doing you're asking for them to be brave and make a decision. And frankly, Mark, that is just a little bit too much for some of our politicians. <laughs> it's a question. I'll let you say that as a politician. I won't comment. My my view is you should never do things by default. You should have a, you should decide what you want to do exactly. and be clear about it. However, the question then is: Is this the best time to do it, given that there are pressures people see on the environment as being really important and life threatening, uh, and clearly some of the debate behaviours have been well different from what we've been used to now? reaction law that's a reaction to something can be challenging and difficult and and what we want to do is avoid a reaction but at the same time decide what the right way is to do it so i i guess i'm saying i think i have great sympathy with your let's make a decision but in a time of heightened tensions and heightened activity that's a difficult thing to do to do it in a kind of constructive way and not overreact one way or the other so what, what's the answer to that? I don't know, maybe you, yeah. Um, and my only other comment, I, I always like to say this, I think it's extremely important we deal with uh, racism, wherever it is, but George Floyd did happen in America. It didn't happen here. And I don't yes. think often that's said enough. Um, maybe maybe it's an argument, maybe, maybe it just reinforces the need to keep our police officers not armed. Um, it, it's, it's an important yeah. comment. So um, I've got some, uh, some questions that uh, have been asked. So, Again, picking up, should the government reform the Public Order Act 1986? Uh, let's start with um, Mark. You can erase this. Let's start with Mike. I just pick up on a couple of points. I think it's um, it's, it's just wrong to say that because George Floyd was killed in America, it's not a problem in the UK. Uh, uh, it's it, it happened. There's there's deaths in custody. There's deaths uh, at police hands. There's racism and discrimination. That's one point. And picking up on Mark's helpful comment about disruption of the community, 
Um, that's one of the conditions or uh, criteria for imposing conditions on assemblies, but it depends on one's view of disruption to the, to the community. Is it simple one day protest or is it the disruption caused by, for example, floods or homelessness or food shortages um, or social inequality, which will naturally flow from a failure to address climate change? And then the going, dealing with the public order point, I think it needs a much more expansive understanding of disruption to the community when one's thinking about imposing these conditions. Because I say the short termism, the myopia of saying because this business is affected for one day, therefore the right to protest ought to be limited is wrong when the disruption which the protesters seek to address is much more serious and long term and in some cases irreversible than that. I think the police fail to take into account the wider perspective when they impose these orders. Before I hand over to you, I just say I did say before I mentioned Floyd that there's still racism and challenges for us in this system. I was reflecting on the fact that a police not being armed is a positive thing and something I, I hear people occasionally saying we should arm the police. I think it's a useful thing to remind them that not being armed is a good thing in our society. Fiona. Um, in terms of the Public Order Act, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm particularly expert in that to offer a view on, on the legislation. But what, what I would say is perhaps one of the, one of the things that uh, the police are quite frustrated by, I suppose, is um, with, with protests, the inability um, to contact organisers and, and uh, set a, a protest place a plan in place and, a, a, and somewhere that they'll be able to go and, and set the rules and I, I actually think this is sometimes because these protests are, are quite fluid and there might not be a very clear leadership but perhaps that's something that needs to be worked on because I completely agree with Mike actually on the the, the fundamental importance of some of the things that these these people are um, are protesting about and actually I've done a lot more on Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter protesters, and I know that there was issue engagement probably early on, um, those, those protests went until the far right joined in, um, almost entirely without violence, uh, with very little abuse and general uh, excellent behaviour. It was just good people who went out to try and um, make a, a very important point. And uh, it's a shame if some of the f th those people's freedoms are being curtailed because there's issues of engagement with the police. And I don't know whether there's a way, and it can't be under statute, but of improving that situation. So certainly the sort of, so organisers of a march have a duty to tell the police, organisers of a protest don't have, which is i.e. a fixed location, don't have that duty. And that does, I think, create challenges for both sides and be able to have arrangements which help protest take place. Um, I should just echo what Fiona said in one respect, sort of many of the protests I've um, dealt with the policing of, even ones where there are challenging individuals, you, you usually find that there is a important public issue at the centre of it and the vast majority of people are turning up to sort of air their voice sort of publicly and peacefully and, and properly and there's no problem with that. There's a tactical challenge comes from the police when a small number of individuals try and infiltrate that march and stir up violence and disorder. And it's quite challenging for the police to have the, the intelligence and the, and the tactics to be able to intercept those people without um, sort of disrupting or undermining the wider peaceful protest. So there are all sorts of challenges around that. But coming back to the question about, sort of, about the law, um, sort of, much as it's easy to have sympathy for Mike's agenda, I don't think you can say to the police, well, um, based on how sympathetic you are with an agenda, e.g. we should be sympathetic towards the climate change agenda, um, the police should have a variable interpretation of what serious disruption in the life of the community is. The police need to operate within the law. And I think your answer might have illustrated my, one of my concerns about vagueness, that serious disruption, as you said, I think, or sort of illustrated, is not defined. And that, that vagueness doesn't help the police. And having real clarity on this is the line, this is this is a reasonable amount of disruption, this is an unreasonable amount of disruption that, that the police should intervene would help a massive make a massive difference. Not just from a policing perspective, from a demonstrator perspective, knowing okay, this is the line I'm allowed to operate with it. Um, and there will always be issues of law and policy um, which at the end of the day sit under 
governments and the laws and decisions they create that will be contentious. Um, the, the way those issues get dealt with is by people arguing their cause and democracy working its slow process and making those decisions. And sort of protest is about providing the vehicle for that, um, for that debate. Um, it shouldn't be about disrupting people going about their lawful business, um, whether that's a, um, a corporation or a shopper um, or a small business sort of uh, man or woman to sort of try and get to work, all of those situations. Um, the protest should not be about, and the law says it isn't about interrupting those, however much an individual group may object to the business of that person. So I had an interesting question sent to me, which I think is, is kind of, may have reflected some of some the discussion. Let's leave America aside. How does our police response compare with other Western countries? I think that'll be quite interesting. Mark, I'm going to go to you first yeah, on that, because so, I, think, um, I think it's an interesting question. So I think we have probably, if not the most, one of the most sort of peaceful, measured, careful approaches to, pro to process. So if I, I draw a couple of distinctions, for example. So you'll see police officers very close with the protesters, integrating with them. Um, there are the liaison officers you'll see talking to the protest organizers of Benedict Bide mm -hmm. to try and sort of keep the communication flow going. You do not see um, police officers sort of creating a them and us by a, a sort of a massive gulf between them and, and some of the sort of routinely aggressive tactics you see elsewhere. So there's a very much attempt to bring community policing style to, um, to protest and to facilitate and assist those events um, take place. Um, you see in fairly non-threatening situations, in my view, you see more routine deployment of sort of paramilitary equipment in, um, in other parts of the world. And it's not that police shouldn't have specialist tools and capabilities and, and weaponry in absolute extremists to escalate when things get into a really ghastly and highly violent state. But that should be the that's where you fall back to if something gets to there. The starting point should be a, a community policing style applied to protest. And I think that's what the um, that's what the police try to do. So I think we're in a in a, a more healthy place, which is why we're having this debate. Well, fairly nuanced points about whether the balance of the law is right in terms of the disruption and challenges it creates for other citizens and businesses. Fiona? I think that um, in British policing, probably a bit of a watershed moment was the death of um, Ian Tomlinson uh, 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 just over 10 years ago now. That was, I was sort of starting out as a, as a crime reporter and I covered uh, the student protests, which I can't remember if they were before or after, but certainly the protests at the Bank of England. And that I, I would, from my experience, of course, I was a journalist, not a protester, but I, I, the kettling was widely used. And it was there was a bit of us and them. Um, the TSG were there in full force and uh, the, the atmosphere wasn't great. And I tell you, when those police horses are sent down and I know that in some situations it's necessary, but it is a very frightening position to be in. But I think the, the what happened to Ian Tomlinson and, and the fallout for that from that, um, probably the police did have to reflect on how they were carrying out those pro their response to protests and that things potentially have improved. Now, I know at some of the recent Black Lives Matter uh, protests when I was, I was coordinating in the office and talking to journalists who were there and there, were, there was a lot of talk about uh, the engagement with the police was actually reasonably good. Um, a lot of them were supportive of that cause personally, uh, but perhaps those things have changed quite significantly over that time. Extinction Rebellion and um, the, the, you know, the, the, the nature of those protests and the things we've seen, seen of newspaper print uh, presses being blockaded, uh, that's much more confrontational. Um, but so it, I, I do think it depends on the nature of the protest as well. Thank you. Yes, I think three points. Um, I mean, I agree with Fiona that after Ian Tomlinson's death, there was a sea change in the language that the police were using and there were reports and there's a return to the sort of peel uh, thinking of, uh, of engagement with the public and, and cooperation. But I think that was superficial and short-lived and it was swept away by the, the London riots which followed soon after. And even when there weren't as disruptive act, criminal activities as that, the underlying use and the storing and the um, contingency plans for the use of force 
has has uh, remained. And so it's really a language thing rather than a practical change. The other thing, just picking up on something that um, Mark Rowley mentioned, is the, as he put it, the weapons that the police have. Uh, there's concern that they maintain these weapons, but also the discriminatory use of them. And I'm perhaps not the best person to, to make the point that they are used in a discriminatory way, from stop and search, the use of tasers, they're used in a discriminatory way. And so in the eyes of the police, the good citizens don't suffer the wrath and the use of those weapons, whereas those at the margins do. And the third point, and I accept um, Mark's point, that, um, that uh, it appears that continental police forces uh, go to the use of their equipment as a first resort rather than last resort. But one mustn't underestimate the soft power used by the police, the intelligence gathering, the use of undercover police forces and units. And we're about to have the first public hearings in November of the undercover police inquiry, where everyone will hear about undercover police in the protest community, forming relationships with unwitting women and having children with them and misusing their privacy in a terrible way. And so the use of soft power, if I can use that, is extremely alarming, as in intelligence gathering in the use of electronic surveillance um, and um, what one has to be very careful about this because even with the seeming co cooperation between the police and the organisers, things can go bad very quickly and the police and the prosecution can use those seemingly constructive meetings as evidence against the so-called organisers at trial. And there's a question of trust there. Should one trust with the police and offer them a blank check at the beginning of a discussion when it could all go terribly wrong with prosecutions at the end? I think that sorry. I think that that's a very conspiracy theorist um, uh, view of the world. Of course, you look back, have, have the police made some mistakes, and and the Met has apologised several times for some of the um, undercover policing issues that are being explored in that inquiry. So yeah, of course, some things have, get, have gone wrong in the past. That's why you have a democracy. That's why you have inspection of police. That's why you have accountability to the courts. That's why you have all of those all of those issues. Um, what we what we were here to discuss, though, was protest, and the police absolutely have a duty um, to do their bit to help lawful protests succeed and happen, and people to be able to hear their voice and for that to work. Uh, my simple proposition is: it's become a heated. There's been become a heated conversation about how effectively that system works, and my proposition is. So the 1986 law, has, as, as the world has moved on and conditions have changed, it now looks vague and weak, and that needs to be dealt with. Now, of course, in that part of that debate, it could move, it could sort of, politicians could decide to move the line and give more freedom to protest or less, and that's, that's a political decision. But if you, want a, if you want law to be meaningful, it has to be practical and, and, sort of, and, uh, and deliverable. And at the moment, the, the public order legislation isn't. And that that can't be a good situation. There's no point having a democracy if you create laws that can't that, that, that are no longer fit for purpose. Right, I, I, I've been taking that question. Before I do, it's just uh, I, you raised the issue of military equipment. I know I said we weren't going to discuss America, but I, I, I'd read something recently that just got up. Uh, that since 1997, the Pentagon has sold $7.4 billion worth of military property to law enforcement agencies. Quite what that constitutes, I'm not sure. But that's an awful lot of military hardware going it's to be It's a crazy, it, Robin, I agree. It's a crazy decision. The sort yes, of, a lot, of the, a lot of the material that was deployed in Iraq um, dealing with terrorist insurgents yeah. now being deployed on the streets of American cities. And, and that is disproportionate and the, I think the message it sends about policing and its relationships with yes. communities um, that, even if it's inadvertent is just it is, it is is so regrettable I think he's playing into the ongoing riots and debates and challenges the Americans are seeing which is why I think we need to position ourselves as do we have issues are we perfect as a, as a police service no we're not but it is so different we shouldn't just be starting military have sorry can I just come back on a couple of points? The first is, I think it was Boris Johnson who ordered the water cannon when he was mayor. Yes. 
kids in hang on fiona can you confirm that i, I think we all we all think that but you can confirm that can't i was you? about to mention the water <laughs> yeah yes i mean so it's it's again it's not it's not limited it's useful to raise the us as the specter but it happens and it's driven by the uk as well and the second point is just to posit this scenario against the background that um policing and public order laws are about the suppression of the public. Just think about when there are food shortages, when there's unrest as a result of inequality, when there's unrest because of homelessness caused by flooding. How will the police exercising enhanced powers in a more robust way look in the light of language about democracy and cooperation and, uh, and, and uh, p policing by consent? It's going to look very bad for the police and it's going to look very bad for any government who has enhanced the police powers and the criminal laws. I, I, so I've had another question, but I'd, I'd like to try and tease that one out. It seems to me that we're having a disagreement here. Over, over, there is a lack of clarity in the law. So the question in, in terms of how the police should behave. Um, and it seems to me that the concerns, it, we say enhanced powers, maybe clearer powers, enhanced or clearer, what is it we're talking about? Um, could we just have a, another thought on that from people? Because that seems to me to be where we're getting a bit of disagreement on the panel, which is a good thing, by the way, because it makes it more interesting. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, have, a, I'll have a stab at that. So um, clarity, so what does serious disruption mean if I... If I run a big protest that runs for many days and has a massive impact on local businesses or local people, at what point does that, what starts off as reasonable execution of my sort of right to freedom of speech and protest, at what point is that having such an impact on other people trying to go about their day to day? or a small degree of last year. That's a political conversation. My point is simply that is unclear what that means at the moment. And secondly, if you're going to give police powers to, to put conditions on protest in terms of you know, where the route a march may take or where a, pro, or where a protest can be or how it, how it might act, which those powers exist, there's no point giving the police those powers if they, are, they have such weak sanctions surrounding them that they are... Um, very, very difficult to enforce. So either, I mean, frankly, take the powers away and say, frankly, we, we want to have a, a more free spirit for protest and all this order, or keep the existing powers, but make them enforceable because of the sanctions and the way they operate. And th those are simple, practical um, things that could be done to make a difference. And so the one that Fiona raised earlier, sort of, it would be much easier if those doing a protest, like those doing the march, have to have some prior engagement with the police. But um, there are some practical ideas. Mike, did you want to make a comment on that? If you, well, I'm going to ask you, as a, I, before you, I'm going to ask you for in a, in a minute, as an observer of these things, as a journalist, what's your kind of view on what you've observed over the past number of years? Mike? Yes, just, just some points. I mean, it's, it's um, obviously one likes clarity, but obviously those in positions of responsibility, I include the police, have a given discretion to exercise and they try their hardest and they shouldn't sh shirk political or legal responsibility by saying that the government ought to clarify very simple words like serious disruption to the life of the community they should just get on with it they'll get it wrong sometimes they can get challenged in the courts either in criminal trials where people are prosecuted or on judicial review as mark has mentioned but i think there is sufficient language there it's not always used in my view but um, moving responsibility back to the politicians to interpret for them relatively simple terms of language is, is I think, is a mistake. And the second thing is just looking at it from the protesters' point of view, from the mother's point of view, from, from, uh, from parents' point of view, when they're looking at the police clamp down on protests which cause short-term disruption to life, the community, and the government fail to act promptly, efficiently, fairly, on the massive disruption that will be caused by the impacts of climate change, then it's at best iniquitous that, that that happens. It's galling and it's just very, very dangerous for us all. And that's why I say that the rule of law is about protecting the environment. And if you clamp down on protests without taking 
the climate emergency seriously, then people are going to protest even more. So, Fiona, I'm going to come to you. I mean, you've you've observed the demonstrations for some time. You 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 have some sense of how far the police are, what what, how far they're able to operate, how far they feel constrained. Can you give us a kind of view on this? And then also a final comment, which I'll then come back to Mike and Mark for final comments each. So think about what you're going to say, some nice controversial thing at the end to make people want to come back to the next time we have a session. Fiona. In terms of my observations, I, I think I wanted to pick up on something that um, Mike mm -hmm. mentioned and obviously the undercover inquiry, which has been um, a, an enormous amount of um, coverage of, of protest and policing over the last few years. Uh, and, and because we're sort of coming at this from uh, the point of view of a rally in Trafalgar Square and, and what the police do to those protesters and how those protesters behave. But he makes a really important point about how they have behaved in the past. And um, whilst I appreciate uh, that uh, mistakes were made and um, obviously uh, undercover officers are surely not um, in de engaging in deceitful relationships anymore, in fact, it was quite widespread. And the impact on the people that that happened to was... Um, um, well, life-changing and, and for the worse, uh, not better. I've interviewed uh, women who, who were in a marriage that, that was a complete lie or had a sexual relationship with somebody who they, they didn't... Um, uh, they weren't aware of their true identity and the, the sense of betrayal and then to have a child with that person I mean it's it's a that is a marmalade dropper of a thing for any member of the general public that that, that happened so I just wonder as I suppose you know we go to these protests and we see that that reaction that that interaction on the surface but we don't know what's going on um, behind the closed doors of the police station and and I wonder if there there should be a little bit more scrutiny of that I um, absolutely appreciate things that have uh, improved but it wasn't so long ago that Jenny Jones, uh, to you know, the uh, the Green uh, member of the London Assembly, was on a police intelligence watch list or, or some such thing, which probably most of us would find quite disturbing and there's been similar stories so whilst we're debating the issues of what, what needs to be toughened up in the public order act or what needs to be clearer um perhaps th there needs to be a little bit and i guess what i'm talking about is what the undercover inquiry is supposed to be doing which is to examine investigate that side of things and then recommend improvements for the future but unfortunately it hasn't even got going yet and it's been going for about the, the in, hearings haven't got going and it's been in the in the works for several Several years, uh, how much information they're going to be able to obtain. I know there were allegations of shredding and, and all sorts of things, so I, I, I am a little bit fearful about that. But yeah, that would be my sort of uh, view on it, that there might be need to be a bit of a balancing up on both sides um, there. Yeah, so um, hopefully that inquiry will um, produce some useful recommendations. I would make the point that um, most of those acts which um, are highly, highly regrettable and inappropriate took place before the legislation was actually put in place that governs undercover work today. Um, so systems are very different, but I'm sure there'll be some lessons that come up that could be improved, could be improved further. And it, 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 um, it's understandable why people are so upset given, given how it was done and what happened. Coming back to the subject of protest, um, a comment that Mike made sort of illustrates something for me. The sort of, Mike said that the law is about protecting the environment. The rule of law is about protecting the environment. It is not at the moment. Um, maybe it ought to be, but it is not. And that's the, um, at the moment, we don't have that sort of first statement in our law that every other law is sort of subservient to that principle. Um, so the, the police are um, acting on the law as it currently stands, and that is their duty. And as I said several times at the moment, that is becoming close to impossibly hard in some situations because of the way the law is constructed for how things work at the moment. So that clarity is what the police need, um, as well as continued scrutiny and uh, and all the challenges the police get when police don't get things quite right. But the police have a duty to, to deliver, help deliver sort of peaceful protest, help support protest, um, to do it without fear or favour, um, to anticipate the small number of difficult individuals or try and turn those peaceful protests into disorder. Um, and the, the sort of powers that are effective to deal with the problems that protests can create when it goes too far. And at the moment, those lines are not clearly enough drawn. Mike, last comment? 
I'll be very quick. I think, Robin, you wanted Good. to... Good. Well done. Well done. I think, I think you wanted some controversy at the end, but I'm going to try and go for something um, um, which is a bit more collaborative, which is I think we ought to move in the, in the same direction. Mm. Because if one solves or addresses the problems that people are concerned about, whether it's racism or sexism or environmental degradation, if the, the government or those with levers of power, business, media and so on, address them seriously and properly, not just through language, then there'd be less scope for those affected, most badly affected, to need to protest, and there'd be less social disruption. And so rather than enhance the tools of the state that suppress social movements and try to address social disruption, if there's as much energy is put into the underlying causes, then I think we're all going to gain from it. Ah, uh, Mike, you fall into the same trap as Mark. You want politicians to do their job properly. I'm sorry, <laughs> mate. You've just fallen into the trap. The it's only one of you that hasn't asked for that is Fiona. Thank you for recognising reality. Um, right, thank you very much. It's uh, been very frustrating for me as, as chair because as a politician, I, I've got lots I wanted to say. But actually, I think the debate's been very good. I think we've managed to tease out what the, the differences are. Um, with, with Mark saying we need to get more clarity and, and Mike saying we need to, to, to we, people should be allowed to operate in a different way because of some of the, the severity of the issues. And Fiona giving us a really interesting kind of views on, on some of the things you've observed and seen. I, I think the quality of journalism today lacks something, but to get journalists to say, actually I've observed and this is what I've seen is very, is very helpful because that's what we need of anything is unbiased people saying, this is my observation. So thank you for that. I, I will just say, I mean, you, you make the point, I mean, things have improved. I know when I first came to London, uh, I, I believe I had a special branch file. And indeed, it was a matter of honour, a badge of honour. If you didn't have a special branch file, you weren't doing your job properly as a politician. Now, those things have changed, but it continues to be challenging. And we need to keep the pressure on to keep improving things. The issue, I think, that, that Mike has raised, which is how do you put the pressure on for big, long-term issues to change? And that is not an easy question, but is a subject for another debate at another time. Uh, can I thank Public Exchange for organising this? I think it's been well, well worthwhile, and I found the, the discussion very stimulating. So thank you to Mark, Fiona, Mike, uh, and I hope everybody that's listening has enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robin.